In the early 1900s, a woman's potential was not deemed as worthy to grasp the scrutiny of society. They were treated as maids with no apparent value rather than the brilliant leaders that would be able to rewrite history. Frances Perkins was a tremendous female leader who was acknowledged for the prevention of harsh labor environments, the fabrication of social security, and though she confronted oppression, she proceeded to accomplish her goals. Working conditions were intolerable in the 20th century. In fact, in New York, there was estimated to be 150 work-related deaths per day, which was about 1,000 deaths a week and over 50,000 deaths a year. Many deaths happened in factories due to illnesses such as asbestos and deadly diseases spread by the immigrant workers. Even more women and children were killed or injured by heavy machinery or potential fires. Let us take you back to March 25, 1911. Imagine being forced to jump out of a building only to fall to certain death or being scorched by flames unable to escape. That day was recognized as the deadliest work-related disaster in the history of New York City. The fire held its title for 90 years until the day two hijacked planes crashed into the Twin Towers, known today as 9-11. It caused the deaths of 146 garment workers. The majority of the workers were young women between the ages of 14 and 23. The sight of the young women mutilated on the pavement shocked Frances Perkins to her soul. The worst part about the fire is that it should have been prevented. First, the fire department should have made sure each fire engine was equipped with nets to catch the people that were jumping out of the burning building. The nets would have prevented many deaths. In addition, the manager had previously locked the doors in order to keep the workers from protesting and leaving the job site. Frances Perkins used her influence as the leader and president of the New York Consumers League to sue the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory for the deaths of their employees. Unfortunately, there were no laws passed stating that managers were responsible for the wrongful deaths of their workers. Like any other great leader, to Frances Perkins, this was only a setback, but never a defeat. Fanny Corlai Perkins was born April 10, 1880, in Boston, Massachusetts, to his parents of Susan Bean Perkins and Frederick W. Perkins. At the vulnerable age of 10, her mother explained to her that she was not very attractive and she would have to find concealed talents to influence society. Her father, an activist, disclosed information to her about the women's suffrage movement. This set the groundwork which would later inspire Frances Perkins to be a public servant. As a young adult, she attended college at Mount Holyoke College in South Hatley, Massachusetts. She wanted to be a social worker. At the Hull House, she gained a wide array of knowledge about her dream job. When the president of the New York Consumers League gave Frances Perkins a call and a proposal she couldn't refuse, she moved to New York for the job. interesting thing about Frances Perkins is that she was a rather reluctant um, cabinet secretary. She was very worried about what her life would be like in Washington um, if she were to join FDR here. Um, she'd been his industrial commissioner for four years in New York. They were already close friends. Um, in exchange for agreeing to take the job, she gave him pretty much a list of demands of what she would insist on happening if she were to become Secretary of Labor. And they are the things that we consider the New Deal now. They're 40-hour work week, uh, workers' compensation as a national program, uh, unemployment compensation, uh, social security, a ban on child labor, and uh, national health insurance. Child labor refers to employment of children in any work that deprives them of their childhood, interferes with their ability to attend regular school, and that is mentally, physically, socially, or morally dangerous and harmful. Child labor is so dangerous, and the reason is simple. Their work was built for adults. Another danger children encounter was the lack of education. Many adolescents didn't know the basic material, such as their ABCs. They wanted to learn, but going to school wasn't feasible. They had to work an eight-hour day or more. That was both mentally and physically exhausting. 
Her new job brought awareness to the sinister issue, and she decided that it was time to take action. Due to the leadership of Frances Perkins, we were able to live in a country in which child labor is not tolerated. Unfortunately, in many countries all over the world, children are forced to work in order to support their families or themselves. Adolescents are still facing the misfortune of having to work long hours every day. The fight is not over to end child labor, but as Henry Ford once said, a leader is someone who demonstrates what's possible. Frances Perkins has left her legacy on American society. Who will step up and continue her legacy for all the children across the world? Hours of labor per day and per week, and second, the technique of raising the income, the wage income or the cash income, of those persons who are engaged in employment in the mass production and other industries. That gives us at once a number of persons, a large number of persons, who have both the leisure in which to spend money and have through their wage levels the money to spend. Out of that we get our great internal market in America and it is the solution of such a problem as that that is the new challenge to industrial life. Frances Perkins was an effective leader at the New York Consumers League. Later, she was promoted to industrial commissioner. During this time, she was thought up by Franklin Roosevelt to become the Secretary of Labor. She made sure to speak her mind, even to the President of the United States. She had certain demands if she were to work for him. In agreement, FDR appointed her Secretary of Labor. Perkins then went on to work for other New Deal initiatives, such as Fair Labor Standards, the Act of 1938, which established the minimum wage and prohibited child labor in most workplaces. As one can see, Frances Perkins was the only female at the bill signing. In fact, in 1933, Franklin Roosevelt appointed Ms. Perkins as the Secretary of Labor, a position she held for 12 years. I think if Frances Perkins could speak here today, she would say, I came to Washington working for FDR, God, and millions of plain, common, forgotten working men. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. We can never ensure 100% of the population against 100% of the hazards and vicissitudes of life, but we have tried to frame a law which will give some measure of protection to the average citizen and to his family against the loss of a job and against poverty-stricken old age. It seems to me that if the Senate and the House of Representatives in this long and arduous session had done nothing more than pass this security bill, Social Security Act, the session would be regarded as historic. Social Security is a government program that provides economic assistance to those that are faced with disabilities, unemployment, and supports the elderly, which is financed by the American working people. Social Security is one of her biggest legacies left by her leadership and has a greater impact on us today. It is surprising that most adults don't know about her because, let's face it, if Frances Perkins didn't alter working conditions, we would not have safety precautions, a fair minimum wage, and children in school where they belong. Due to the benefits of Social Security, homelessness decreased, but this didn't happen with the snap of a finger. It happened over the course of four long years. Frances Perkins didn't only alter working conditions, but she changed society's minds. No one thought that a woman could sit in the White House. Frances Perkins' legacy lives on today as each racial and gender barrier is slowly but surely broken down over time. She started the process. It's up to our generation to continue her work. Frances Perkins did it. We can too. Radiac, radiac.